Good afternoon, everyone. It's one o'clock and we are very excited to start and welcome you to the 18th annual Transfusion Medicine Education Symposium organized by OrbCon and Canadian Blood Services. Today's session is titled Bloody Well Prepared, Optimizing the Safety of Transfusion for Hemostasis. And as you know, often these annual conferences are focused on red cell transfusions. And this year we've gone the other way and focusing on all the components and products that are essential in hemostasis. Next slide. So here's the agenda. My name is Doreen Bruce. I'm the clinical project coordinator with Orbcon. I'm moderating the first part of this session. And then towards the end, Dr. Jonathan Mack from Canadian Blood Services in Ottawa will do the interactive question and answer period. We have three excellent speakers for you today. Um, Dr. Zeller from McMaster University will be talking about pathogen-reduced platelets. Dr. Petro Soniak um, will be talking about pharyngeal replacement. And Dr. Rebert will be talking about solvent detergent plasma. And so we have all the things that um, we all know that we either have implemented in our labs or will be implementing soon in our laboratories. So this is extremely timely to bring up uh, these issues. And of course, what they have in common uh, is not just that they are essential in hemostasis, but that they're all pathogen reduced. Fibrinogen concentrate, of course, is uh, unlike cryo. And so the pathogens reduced, as I probably don't need to remind you, when COVID-19 hit three years ago, uh, with all the uncertainty that came with it, it was also for Canadian Blood Services, the uncertainty of whether this could be transmitted by transfusion. And so having pathogen reduced products are a huge advantage in, in reducing some of that anxiety if and when we deal with a new emerging pathogen. Next slide. So we'd like to acknowledge here Canadian Blood Services, OrbCon and the Ministry of Health for their support in developing this program and to thanking the contributors to the planning, organizing and hosting of this event. The webcast will be recorded and by participating, you indicate your consent to recording, archiving and use for educational purposes. So our learning objectives for today are, first of all, to describe the different types of platelets and plasma and fibrinogen components and products available for patients. Secondly, to identify the risks and benefits of transfusing these components and products to patients. Thirdly, to explain possible strategies to reduce the risk um, of adverse events when transfusing blood components and products. And finally, to recommend the most appropriate components for clinical situations. Here's a reminder, please observe all your organization's requirements for COVID-19 precautions if you're watching as a group. And on that note, if you are watching as a group, as a member of a group, but you have not previously registered individually, um, get your smartphone out because in a minute I will be showing a slide with the QR code. So if you have not yet registered and you are attending as a member of a group, there's a QR code that you can use to still register and then uh, get the CME after. So this um, event has been accredited by the Royal College uh, as a group learning activity in section one. Unfortunately, this year we did not manage to get accreditation from the College of Family Physicians of Canada. So family physicians uh, attending, and I certainly hope they are, um, you will be able to claim this only as a non-accredited event. So as I mentioned, if you registered uh, as an individual and you're watching at your computer, then your attendance has automatically been recorded when you signed into this session. If you're watching as a group at your facility and you've previously registered, then your attendance has been captured with your registration. And if you have not yet registered, but you are watching as a part of a group now, please scan the code on the screen and confirm your attendance that way. If you don't get a chance to do it now, this slide will also be shown again um, after the panel discussion with the closing slides. 
all attendees who fill out the uh, evaluation form at the end are eligible for a draw for a prize, and the uh, that will be announced. Uh, they will be uh, announced by email uh, about a month after. Next, so there is an evaluation survey, of course, we all know about those. Um, we really need to know what you think about this uh, uh, session today, about the education, um, what you think about the session for now, and any feedback you give us will be extremely helpful in planning our next year's event. This is what the certificate uh, looks like for physicians uh, to use for the Royal College candidates. If you have a question um, for any of the uh, presenters, please submit your questions through the Q&A box. And we will not take questions after the individual sessions. They will all be addressed by Dr. Jonathan Mack um, with the uh, speakers at the end of the afternoon session. So we'll take about almost an hour, I think, for questions. And this morning, it was an extremely uh, helpful and engaging and informative session. So I hope that you will stay until the very last minute because you will learn everything that you wanted to know and may not have been able to figure out from all the education that's been ongoing already. If you cannot put a question in through the Q&A box, some people have had trouble with that, put your question in the chat and we will see it as well. You will not be able to unmute your microphones for the Q&A session. So we only take questions through the Q&A or if necessary, through the chat. Faculty disclosure, um, the symposium, symposium planning committee and speakers have not declared any relationships with commercial interests. The program has not received financial support and has not received in-kind support from any commercial organization, and there are no conflicts of interest declared. So let's get started. Our first uh, speaker today is Dr. Andrew Petrosoniak, who will be talking about fibrinogen replacement, underutilized and often forgotten. Dr. Petrosoniak is an emergency physician and trauma team leader at St. Michael's Hospital. He's the inaugural lead for transitional simulation at Unity Health Toronto. He is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto, where his research work focuses on, first of all, using in situ simulation to improve systems and design, and secondly, optimizing the care of leading patients. Dr. Petrosoniak is a co founder and co principal of Advanced Performance Healthcare Design, a design and consulting firm that uses simulation to inform and enhance high stakes decision making. Dr. Petrosoniak, over to you, please. Okay, um, I'm I'm optimistic that we're going to be a little bit better with the um, uh, with the tech. I think are we doing better? Can you guys see the slides? I can. Yes, we have thumbs up. You, we got thumbs up. You can hear me, which is good. And are the slides moving back and forth? Is that OK? Well, I'll I figure you guys will stop me if I OK. Um, great, thanks everybody for being here. Um, it's a pleasure. Uh, I work at St. Mike's in Toronto. And uh, I'm an eMERGE doc and a trauma doc. And, and so let's get started. We're going to talk about fibrinogen um, replacement. Um, and a couple disclosures. I have done some um, volunteer work for OrbCon. Uh, I do uh, uh, run a, um, a simulation uh, company that uh, that does work, nothing that will be discussed today. And I have done some previous advisory board work for AstraZeneca um, a few years ago, but nothing that um, impacts uh, today's talk. We're gonna talk about three main things. We're gonna, we're, the objectives we're gonna talk about um, uh, fibrinogen concentrate versus cryo, so that replacement. We're going to talk about the indications for uh, fibrinogen replacement, um, specifically uh, concentrate, and then sort of how that fits into uh, the MHP and where fibrinogen uh, lives there. Um, 
This is, I mentioned at the beginning, this is, I promise um, in the morning, this is the only talk um, in about five years that I have any type of pathophysiology in, but I do know that there's a, a bunch of smart people listening in here that that will be able to, you know, um, well, probably out pathophys me uh, for, uh, for sure. Uh, that said, I do think it's probably important we just briefly, I promise it's only one slide, so this is a clinically focused talk, but uh, talk briefly just about what the role of uh, fibrinogen is. When you have damaged blood vessels, there's a response and that early platelet plug it, it gets formed. Fibrinogen has a role in, in that early um, components. Uh, in addition, uh, fibrinogen is then broken down uh, into fibrin and, and is, is present for the development of a more stable clot. And so it's absolutely critical that if you're going to solve bleeding uh, the bleeding problem that you have fibrinogen there. Uh, and and that will sort of form the crux of the conversation that we're going to have here. By all means, I won't be answering questions during the talk, but please put your um, questions in the chat. Uh, we, we had a really great uh, forum afterwards at the end, uh, the last um, in the morning, uh, and we went through a bunch of different questions. Uh, so I... Um, I look forward to anything that you guys uh, have to have to comment on there. Um, and so that's probably the extent of the the pathophys. I promise you that it does blow my mind. i'm 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 more clinically focused and and so let's get into what what do we actually see? So what do we know? Regardless of why you're bleeding, regardless of the cause of bleeding, whether it's be a GI bleed, trauma related, perioperative, obstetrical, we know that um, active hemorrhage does result in a decrease in fibrinogen. It's one of the earliest factors uh, or components that are um, that decrease, not in all cases, but certainly the one that it, it can go down quite early, very um, uh, uh, early on in hemorrhage. And it is associated with uh, morbidity and mortality. So as fibrinogen goes down, morbidity, mortality goes up. And that looks different for the different types of patients. In some instances, it's that they need more products. In some instances, there's actually patient-oriented outcomes that they have higher chance of death, lengthier time in the in, in, um, in hospital, lengthier time in the ICU. Uh, but by and large, bad things happen when fibrinogen goes down um, to you know, a low level in a bleeding patient. The crux, the main question though that we're left with is does fibrinogen replacement lead to better outcomes? And sort of the summary is expressed right here. We, we don't fully know. Uh, and that's because there's a lack of data that really tells us with, with high degree of certainty that fibrinogen replacement, compared to those that don't have fibrinogen replacement when they're bleeding, that they're going to do better. And this has been, you know, this isn't just me saying this, this is sort of in the, in what's in out there in the literature, in the, the editorials that exist, high quality evidence is lacking that fibrinogen supplementation improves outcomes. That's not to say that it doesn't, uh, but it's also not a guarantee that it does. The thought, however, is that if fibrinogen is low and it's important in stopping bleeding and you're bleeding, then it would seem appropriate to replace that. And we apply that sort of principle broadly for um, uh, lots of things in, in medicine. What will give us a bit more certainty and we'll talk about this study a couple times in this talk, is cryostat. And cryostat is a randomized trial out of the UK that uh, is going to, um, well, it's actually just finished, and it, we're expecting results in June. And those um, those results uh, compare, or the, the study compares uh, early fibrinogen replacement with standard um, standard approach to massive hemorrhage. And so I'll talk a bit more about, about that along the way, but that should, that would be one of the best studies to outline what, what we should expect going forward. 
So if we work under the assumption that we probably should replace fibrinogen when it's low, the real question that comes up is what, what should we use? In Ontario, uh, and certainly at St. Mike's, and, and what we've sort of recommended through the provincial MHP here in, in Ontario, is that fibrinogen concentrate is what we're gravitating towards for a few different reasons. Um, in contrast, cryoprecipitate can also uh, provide and has been traditionally the source of fibrinogen replacement. So what do these two things look? On the left, we're going to talk about, uh, um, it will we'll indicate uh, fibrinogen concentrate. On the right uh, is, is, um, uh, is cryoprecipitate. Standard dosing for, um, for uh, fibrinogen concentrate is about four grams. And so when we give this, uh, we're usually giving about four grams. That's what's common in literature. In the cryostat study, it's actually six grams, but they're, but they're giving it as, a, um, as cryoprecipitate. A standard dose of uh, cryoprecipitate around 10 units Rough well is a bit variable in terms of its if, if volume of uh, or a quantity of fibrinogen, and that's one of the knocks against cryo is that you're not guaranteed to get an exact amount. You don't exactly know how much you're giving. Um, you make sort of best guess estimates, and it tends to be a little bit less. So you have to give a bit greater volume to be able to get uh, the same amount of of uh, fibrinogen. Predominantly, fibrinogen concentrate is fibrinogen. Uh, the Fibriga um, monograph does indicate that there are some other components in there, some other factors, but not probably as much as we would get with cryoprecipitate. Uh, in cryo, it, you get fibronectin, uh, platelet microparticles, uh, von Willebrand's factor, a bunch of other factors. How much that plays a role uh, is, is uncertain. Is that a good thing that they're there? Does that risk you know, more side effects? Uh, we actually don't really know the answer, but the point is, is it's it's just a more of a statement of what we're getting. What we did here when we were running the first two trial, which is a, a, a trial that looked at um, early fibrinogen uh, for MHP trauma patients, was the rapid reconstitution. When you when you download that onto the nurses at the bedside, that actually can be a bit of a drawback. In fact, they I bet you if you ask them, they would actually prefer cryo because it comes right from blood bank. They have to do less, and they just have to hang it. So I think it's important to recognize that when we you know until fibrinogen concentrate is is widely adopted, uh, that it will um, that that there's still some challenges just recon rapid reconstitution still does take a few minutes and it's people's time and when the alternative is they could be giving life-saving medication or other blood products you know it's a real it is a real um uh um it, it is a real time uh, uh amount that that's required to to be giving um that that product at the bedside so it's important to understand you know from different perspectives what uh what is required and what this means um, the shelf life obviously favors fibrinogen concentrate and, uh, you know, the, the risk of pathogens and, and um, transfusion reactions is really quite low with, uh, with fibrinogen. In terms of how do they compare in the clinical environment, this is probably the best trial and a big shout out to Jeannie Callum and, and her collaborators on leading this study a few years ago. This was in cardiac surgery patients and they compared fibrinogen concentrate with, with cryoprecipitate. Uh, they concluded uh, that in patients undergoing cardiac surgery who develop clinically significant bleeding and hypofibrinogenemia after bypass, fibrinogen concentrate is non-inferior to um, cryoprecipitate. And so this at least tells us that at the doses roughly that we would expect to be giving, that fibrinogen is at least as good as as cryo. So it's probably reasonable from a clinical perspective. And so then you just look at the logistics and the other safety um, elements and you and it does seem that that probably um, the, the concentrate would be favored. But again, everything is this is all, a, you know, a bit of a balance and we make decisions knowing that there's not one ideal uh, product and, uh, you know, we we do what is best 
uh, with the evidence that we have uh, under the circumstances um, that, that we're using it for. What we do know is that um, it's clear that, that plasma doesn't give us enough fibrinogen. It's inadequate for uh, fibrinogen replacement. And th the concentration of fibrinogen is just too low in these um, in in plasma to be suitable for uh, to to imagine that you're going to get um, an increase in in fibrinogen, particularly as you start to give large volumes. And so, just reasonable to think that okay, this is not a strategy to replace. So, what are the indications for fibrinogen replacement? Uh, and and what does that look like? And I've kind of broken it down across three broad categories of bleeding. There's the trauma bleeding, the perioperative bleeding, the obstetrical bleeding. I have left off GI bleeding and vascular bleeding, uh, which is sort of probably the other big ones. Uh, but there's just not enough data out there now. And 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 to be honest, there's not great data across all of these um, uh, across all these domains. But I'll present what we have. When we talk about trauma and hemorrhage, uh, we had a few years ago, we, we thought about it as the lethal triad, and that was hypothermia, acidosis, and, and coagulop um, coagulopathy. They've added in hypocalcemia more recently, and we now have the, dim the lethal diamond. Uh, but really at the crux of this is the coagulopathy that occurs at the moment that the patient gets injured, that something, that there's a cascade of events that triggers from the injury uh, a a sequence of uh, of of um, outcomes where bleeding tends to be favored, and uh, as a result, or as perhaps the cause is a low fibrinogen level, and so along with giving TXA, the idea that we would give early um, fibrinogen, it probably seems to, it does make sense, at least from what we understand from a pathophysiologic perspective. But these three questions are still there in trauma. And this was in a recent, these questions were in a recent um, editorial that, you know, one, does early replacement reduce mortality? Does uh, the risk um, is there. What's the risk of post-traumatic VTE, and and is cryo better than um, fibrinogen concentrate or vice versa? Which one is preferred in trauma? And we we still don't have the answers to these. Cryostat, which um, I think is probably going to be one of the most important studies around fibrinogen that, that we've seen to date, is a study that's going to be presented in June, or that's the expectation. It's a study of about 1,500 patients randomized to uh, two arms, one cryo plus standard MHP versus standard MHP. This is in the UK. Their primary outcome uh, is 28-day mortality, which is nice to see that it's a patient-oriented outcome. Maybe 28 days is a little long. You know, you might imagine that maybe that that early dosing of, of cryo uh, won't have much of an impact at 28 days. Hard to know, but I guess if you survive through those first phases, then the expectation is that you keep living to 28 days, and perhaps this will uh, capture any sort of longer downside effect of, you know, perhaps a higher VTE rate or something. So, nonetheless, this is what we're waiting for. And what's what the the cryo or the um, fibrinogen replacement that they're using. Uh, is cryoprecipitate. They're giving a total of about six grams within about 60 to 90 minutes of hospital ar arrival. And then otherwise, um, patients who, these are patients who are adults who um, are, are traumatically injured and are needing some degree of blood. So we don't really know exactly how sick these patients are, what they exactly look like, but the trialists who are running this, I mean, this is a, this should be a really impressive study, very much looking forward to uh, to the outcome. Um, I did plan on trying to pull you guys in the chat and stuff, but I, uh, the way that the interface is, I'm not able to see, uh, the chat, but I'm curious. I mean, give some thought. What do you guys think is going to come out of this? I think fairly pivotal, um, blood product trial. Uh, the, the idea that early, um, cryo is going to, is it going to meaningfully make a difference to patients? You know, that's that's the question that, you know, we're all awaiting the answer. Um, my The pessimistic side of me says it's not going to make a difference. 
though I hope that it does, because this really would benefit patients. It would give us another tool to do. It's just so hard to find uh, to find um, products, whether they be you know medications, blood products, anything that actually move the needle and and make a difference because we've gotten so good at taking care of these patients with all of the other elements of, of a high quality critical care that it is, it just gets increasingly difficult to make meaningful outcome um, differences or changes. So I my, if I had to bet, I would say, I don't think it's gonna change, um, but I want it to because it seems to make sense and it would validate what I think about how, how we should be treating these patients. Nonetheless, we don't have those guidelines yet. We don't have that information, but we will soon. Um, in the meantime, and this is what we have up until now, most of the tra trauma hemorrhage guidelines recommend using some laboratory measure uh, to trigger uh, administration. And, and typically that's less than 1.5 uh, grams per liter, or if you're using Rotem, which most of us are not in, in Ontario, um, and I and I can't speak more broadly to Canada, but by and large, we're not a big Rotem country uh, or TEG country, I don't think, um, uh, with, the, with the exception of a few select groups. We do have it at, at St. Mike's, um, but uh, you could use FibTem less than 12, which is a measure on the Rotem um, of, of fibrinogen uh, levels. Um, and it corresponds to about 2.2, and we'll talk about that later. In the um, in the operative space, the, the results are mixed as to what, um, you know, does replacement of perioperative bleeding, um, does it does it help? Um, and it does seem that there's a bunch of studies where it uh, replacement uh, of fibrinogen does help. Uh, there are some studies where it's equivocal, but there's really not a lot of studies that say that there's harm or that we shouldn't give it. So if we start to weigh these out, it would favor giving it and replacing it. And what nicely, you know, fortunately, we're not seeing any increase in VTE. And then we can move to uh, the obstetrical literature. And let's look at one study that was done a couple of years ago. This was a population, I mean, again, a small study, 55 patients. That's why Krausstadt's gonna be so important that you know, you're looking at 1500 patients, which is really impressive. But a population of, of 55 patients, postpartum hemorrhage. And the question is, is uh, fibrinogen replacement versus um, placebo? Um, so uh, the outcome, uh, was uh, products transferred or um, and different than than what we'll see um, in in Krausstadt, which was a patient oriented outcome. They found no difference. Now, so they gave to some of these patients that were bleeding, some of these women that were bleeding, uh, they gave fibrinogen. Some got placebo. They found no difference. Now, interestingly enough, the entry into the study, you actually didn't have to have that low of a fibrinogen level. And so when they did a subgroup analysis of those who did have pretty low levels, they did find potential benefit in terms of they had lower um, need for transfusion if you replace them. So it probably speaks to the bit of a Goldilocks effect, like you do need to find the right spot where it where there's where there's benefit. And then some follow up, another another study that did a sort of a pre post up for, um, previously, they used to give sort of a stat pack, they called it, or a resuscitation pack of of, of a suite of 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 products to patients that were having post obstetrical hemorrhage or postpartum hemorrhage. What they found was, uh, and, and then they compared it to those that um, uh, they changed their process and they, they decided, you know what, we're going to only use Rotem. So they did, you know, a few years before that uh, implementation and then a few years after. What they found was when they studied these patients, first of all, postpartum hemorrhage does not equal coagulopathy. So only about a quarter of these women who lost over a liter and a half of blood, so not insignificant. I mean, this is fairly large volume blood loss. Uh, only a quarter of them had low fibrinogen levels. So it really does speak to the point that empiric tracement, empiric replacement is likely unnecessary. Um, however, in the subgroup that that had placental abruption, it, virtually uniformly associated with hypofibrinogenemia. So what can we take from that? Probably lab guided or Rotem guided is is the way to go. Empiric treatment in these patients, you know, we're really trying to minimize 
giving extraneous or um, um, unneeded, unnecessary product to pregnant women or or postpartum women. Uh, so probably not needed uh, in all cases. But if you are going to be empiric with it, um, certainly those that are having abruption. And so how do we summarize this? Where do we, what do we take from this? Well, in trauma and perioperative patients, the, the data seems to support giving it to patients who have numbers, values less than 1.5. Obstetrical, we bumped it up a little bit because the patients in the um, in the peripartum and and um, uh, sort of the antenatal uh, period will have numbers in the in above two, even three, four, five, and so the goal is is to keep it higher than that. So we've we've gravitated towards a higher number. And just so for your context, if you're looking at the literature and you're looking at these values of FibTAMs and you're wondering what the heck that's all about, that corresponds to roughly about 2.2 um, grams per liter. So that sort of makes sense that FibTAMs less than 12, probably it's useful to, to, to give if you're using that. And then where does fibrinogen fit in MHP? Interestingly, the... Um, the Europeans uh, give two options for how to do an MHP. They use a ratio based, so RBCs, two RBCs to one FFP, or uh, RBCs plus fibrinogen concentrate. And so they give kind of equal weighting to this. This is different than what we see in, yeah. in North America, where we very much favor a ratio based approach. But it is interesting that fibrinogen has such a prominent role in the European. Um, literature and in the European approach, whereas we've kind of put it, um, it's taken a bit of a back seat here. And you can see this in sort of how we've described, and I'll use Ontario as an example, um, with our recommendations out of, um, for, for MHP that we put together a few years ago. For large hospitals, first pack gets four RBCs, the next pack gets four RBCs plus four FFP. And that's a two to one ratio. And then it's not till the third cooler comes down that we would start to give fibrinogen concentrate. Um, it's interesting, you know, this is what we sort of decided to do. Um, as we reflect back on this, you know, the Europeans would look at this and say, you're waiting too long to give your fibrinogen concentrate because it's not till at least 12 units, if not more, that you're starting to replace that. And perhaps they're right. In smaller hospitals or hospitals without access to FFP, uh, we recommend earlier fibrinogen concentrate, and that's coupled with PCC, though I think these recommendations may, may change over time uh, as we analyze the first two data and with the results of, of cryostat. And then there's places that don't have access to fibrinogen uh, um, uh, levels. And so the the literature, again, this is really only trauma-based because the, the literature is scant elsewhere. But patients who are critically injured, who have hemoglobins less than 100, base excess is less than, point, than minus 6, or a systolic less than 90, are more likely, doesn't mean they're guaranteed, but more likely to have low fibrinogen. And so if you're in a place where you can't get a fibrinogen level, uh, and you're trying to guess whether you should replace if I saw any of these, and I and I occasionally I do some locum work in in smaller hospitals where we don't have access to FFP, I would preemptively give it if in patients that have sustained systolics less than ninety, who have hemoglobins less than one hundred, and who are bleeding. And so for me, I think this is you know reasonable. That said, in 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 the studies that that uh, describe this, it's really only about fifty to seventy five percent when they then look at the subsequent fibrinogen level that will actually have low fibrinogen. So it's not a guarantee. You might be over treating by following these, but you know sometimes you don't have better information and that's all you got. And so we'll wrap up uh, with a couple cases uh, just to walk you through sort of how I think about this. Um, a 50 year old male uh, MVC, hypotensive, fast positive pelvic fracture. I think we all agree this patient sounds quite sick. Uh, there certainly would seem to benefit from some blood product uh, resuscitation. Our current practice at St. Mike's and sort of uh, what we've published on favors just get some packed red blood cells into these patients. Over the next 15 to 30 minutes, you reassess how they are. 
do they really need an MHP? If we imagine that this patient, this guy, continues to be sick, uh, then we would activate the MHP after about three units of PAC cells. And, and then I would wait for the cooler to come down, and, and by the third cooler, I'm going to have fibrinogen. And I'll tell you that despite my affinity for fibrinogen, I don't give it that often. I do wait for the lab values uh, because practically there's just a lot of other things that are happening at the bedside. Our nurses are pretty task focused on getting in a bunch of blood products, uh, and we really haven't changed our culture to really favor fibrinogen early. We did just run the first two trial, which was kind of um, which was a study for uh, patients getting standard fiber, um, standard MHP, comparing to uh, patients that get PAC cells plus PCC and fibrinogen concentrate. And it's pretty clear that that introducing a new product at the bedside takes time, uh, is challenging, and you know even though it's pretty quick to give, it still requires five ten minutes of nurse time when they could be doing something else to reconstitute it. And so I am typically acting in a responsive way rather than a or a reactive way to fibrinogen than I am proactively. And, um, you know, I, I continue to reflect on my practice. I'm, I'm, I think that I could do better there. I think we could give it earlier, uh, but the culture within our site uh, and, and broadly around Canada in trauma care I don't think we've really emphasized fibrinogen uh, beyond once you get a level and you respond to it. So I think cryostat will really move the needle uh, and really guide us here uh, for what what is um, what the future holds for fibrinogen and trauma. Uh, but but that's that's kind of how I look at it right now. For a patient, a 23 year old um, postpartum hemorrhage, but a liter and a half of blood loss, what? would be a reasonable plan for fibrinogen concentrate. You know, again, we're gonna focus on getting PAC cells in as needed and really just stopping the bleeding with additional agents, Ooh. oxytocin and that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, or, or manual tamponade and then figuring out what we can do next. It, the, the literature seems to support waiting for these patients until you get a fibrinogen level. Unless the patient is, you know, near death, uh, I, I probably would wait for a level. It just seems like that's what is most um, reasonable based on the evidence. And then finally, uh, a 78 year old male uh, with uh, undergoing a, bi a bypass post out bleeding that's fairly significant. And again, this is a little bit area outside of what I'm usually practicing. Um, but uh, the literature would suggest that, you know, resuscitate these patients appropriately and use uh, lab-based values, whether they be Rotem or the traditional fibrinogen level to guide your replacement. And empiric treatment is, is maybe less certain. And so we'll wrap up with these hopefully five key take-home points. One, we do know that, that hemorrhage results in low levels of fibrinogen. That's very clear. We think that it's beneficial to replace it. It would make sense that it does, uh, but we we don't have high degree of certainty there. It, overall, it sh we would favor fibrinogen concentrate over cryo, but recognize like it is again, you know, there's there's pros and cons to both. But I would say we would overall uh, fibrinogen concentrate is probably the preferred agent. Uh, probably rather than empiric therapy lab-based or Rotem-based um, approach to, to administration is best uh, for, for sort of all comers. Recognizing this entire talk's gonna get blown up perhaps uh, based on the results of cryostat. So I'll have to rejig the whole thing, but as a, and, and finally, yeah, the new data, you know, may change these recommendations or may change my thoughts about this. And so with that, um, I'm gonna conclude. Uh, you can reach out to me uh, via email. Uh, you can reach out to me uh, on Twitter, uh, and I'll be around uh, when we're talking uh, afterwards in in the um, in, in the uh, in, in the uh, group session. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vertusoniak, for an excellent. Uh, 
overview and very thoughtful overview of pharyngen uh, concentrate and cryoprecipitate and and we're all anxiously awaiting the results of that trial. I think uh, with the implementation of fibrinogen concentrate, for which there are many good reasons, as you as you outlined, um, the question sort of came up often in, in to Orbcom: What's the evidence for fibrinogen concentrate and the efficacy in to stop bleeding? And I think that we've just used cryo for so long that uh, we've sort of forgotten that there actually wasn't a really good clinical evidence for the efficacy of cryo. So you know, it's it's uh, very timely to see that uh, that study being done, and hopefully there will be more to follow. So thank you very much for a really fantastic overview of those issues. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our next speaker, Dr. Michelle or Mickey Zeller, on what's new in platelets from Canadian Blood Services. Dr. Zeller has pre-recorded her presentation. Dr. Zeller is an associate professor and clinical hematologist for the division, with the Division of Hematology and Thromboembolism at the Department of Medicine, McMaster University. And she's also the co-director of Operations Transfusion Medicine for Hamilton Health Sciences. She's the program director for the Transfusion Medicine Area of Focused Competence Diploma Program at McMaster University. She's also a medical officer at Canadian Blood Services and a core member of the Michael de Groot Center for Transfusion Research. Dr. Zeller has completed postgraduate training and programs in internal medicine, hematology, and transfusion medicine, in addition to a master's in health professions education. On to our presentation by Dr. Zeller. What's new in platelets from Canadian Blood Services? This slide shows my disclosures, and I would like to acknowledge that many of the slides in this presentation were developed by an expert group of people at Canadian Blood Services. And why they are important in maintaining hemostasis you will be able to identify the platelet products available from Canadian Blood Services and their specific indications, explain how platelet components are pathogen reduced and the benefits offered compared with conventional platelet components, and that you'll be able to describe the pathogen reduced platelet component implementation to Canadian hospitals. Here are some acronyms that will be used throughout the talk. I'd like to begin by providing a background about platelets. Starting with where do platelets come from? Megakaryopoiesis is the process of development of mature megakaryocytes from hematopoietic stem cells. Thrombopoiesis is the generation of platelets from megakaryocytes. Cytokine thrombopoietin or TPO is the main regulator for both megakaryopoiesis and thrombopoiesis. These processes occur in the bone marrow and megakaryocytes, which are the cell that is highlighted by this yellow arrow, are what forms platelets that then circulate in our circulation. And for what purpose? There are actually a number of functions that platelets do for us. The one we're gonna spend the most amount of time on is how platelets mediate primary hemostasis, but they also participate in primary immunity by helping to trap bacteria in neutrophil-derived DNA nets. They affect tumor progression by stimulating angiogenesis. They help to close the ductus arteriosus at the time of birth, and they contribute to inflammatory mediators in some forms of arthritis and play a role in the separation of the lymphatic circulation from the arterial and venous circulation 
during embryogenesis. This figure demonstrates stages in platelet plug formation. Prior to vascular injury, platelet activation is suppressed by endothelial cell-derived inhibitory factors. Once there is injury, thrombin and collagen von Willebrand factor complexes initiate development of a platelet plug by capturing and activating moving platelets. Platelets adhere and spread, forming a monolayer. Next, the platelet plug extends with additional platelet activation. Activated platelets stick to each other via bridges formed by the binding of fibrinogen, fibrin, or von Willebrand factor. And finally, close contacts between platelets in the growing hemostatic plug, along with a fibrin meshwork shown in red, help to perpetuate and stabilize a platelet plug. Once again, those those major phases could be considered adhesion, activation, and aggregation. Okay, let's move to another part of this talk, that being platelet transfusion, specifically at Canadian Blood Services. Platelets can be collected by two main processes. The first is to pool random donor platelets from whole blood donations, and the second is a single donor who undergoes apheresis collection. Some products are now undergoing pathogen inactivation technology, and we'll get to that in a little bit. The volume across different products varies. It can be anywhere from 184 to 317 ml per unit, depending on the product type. And as well, the yield and concentration varies as well. All the platelets that I'm talking about in this talk are stored at room temperature between 20 and 24 degrees on an agitator. And the shelf life for these products is seven days. There are no alternatives to a platelet. These are some statistics from the fiscal year 2021-2022, and they do not include the pathogen-reduced products, but in total there were about 120,000 platelets that were distributed across the country, not including Hema Quebec, um, and the majority were Buffy Coat platelet pools, and these are costs, um, but keep in mind these costs do not take into consideration, again, pathogen reduction, um, and they also don't take into consideration the tubing, the testing, the time it takes on the hospital side to give these products. And why do we transfuse platelets at all? Well, in patients with quantitative and or qualitative platelet disorders, there are two reasons. The first is for treatment of bleeding, and the second is in the prevention of bleeding. In 2016, Orbcon put together a quality improvement plan on platelet transfusion indications and other uh, blood components as well, but I'm presenting specifically the platelet transfusion indication one that was based on the guidelines available at the time that it was developed. Um, and these are some helpful resources that I've listed on the slide, but there is a new ICTMG guideline that hopefully will come out soon However, what's written on this slide in terms of clinical setting and the recommendation and dose is pretty widely accepted at present time. In addition to all required donor testing, in non-pathogen reduced platelet products, each platelet donation will, or any donation that results in a platelet being made, will undergo back to your alert testing. And this is done at the 24 hour mark into the uh, post collection. And then the, um, the units are distributed to hospitals, but the testing will continue for the life of the platelet. There are a number of risks. And here I've listed some risks that are um, generalized to different blood components like a red cell, a plasma, and a platelet. Um, and then I've specifically provided the septic reactions to a platelet concentrate, and these are non-pathogen reduced platelet concentrates. So bacterial sepsis based on CBS surveillance data is around one in 125,000. Death from bacterial sepsis, again, in a platelet concentrate pre-pathogen reduced is uh, around one in a million. 
And then I provided some of the other transfusion risks, including febrile reactions, mild allergic reactions, trolley, taco, and there are more, um, but I haven't provided these specific to platelets. Let's talk now about pathogen inactivation technology, or PIT. Bacterial contamination remains a risk following blood transfusion, particularly with platelet products as they're stored at room temperature. To improve blood safety, many countries have implemented pathogen inactivation technologies to reduce the risk of bacterial transmission. Pathogen inactivation technology reduces the risk of transfusion transmitted pathogen infections and provides an additional layer of safety. So PIT reduces the risk of viruses, enveloped, non-enveloped, bacteria, and that includes gram-positive, gram-negative, spirochetes, protozoa parasites, white blood cells or leukocytes, which can no longer replicate and produce cytokines rendering irradiation unnecessary. And we'll come back to this last point soon. Amatosaline is the active photoreactive compound of the serous intercept PIT system. Amatosaline is a synthetic sorolin, and it's added to the platelet component and intercalates within nucleic acids that compose the DNA and RNA of cells, bacteria, viruses, and parasites. Sorolin becomes activated when exposed to ultraviolet A illumination, causing permanent cross-linking between nucleic acid strands. This leads to DNA RNA damage and inactivate cells and pathogens which may be present in a platelet unit. Any residual sorolin is removed by a compound adsorptive device. The toxicity of sorolin-based treatments has been extensively studied in in vitro, in animal studies, and in clinical trials. The residual sorolin amount after platelet preparation is minimal and falls well below toxic thresholds. It is important to highlight that while pathogen-reduced platelets are new to Canada, they have been routinely used in Europe since the mid-2000s. Intercept has been commercialized for nearly 20 years with approximately 8.5 million Intercept-treated products administered globally. Large multinational hemovigilance databases have confirmed the excellent safety profile seen in preclinical studies. Let's move now to a discussion of production. Two untreated or non-pathogen reduced platelet products are manufactured by Canadian Blood Services, and those are the untreated pooled platelets in plasma and untreated apheresis platelets in plasma. In December 2021, Health Canada approved the use of Cirrus Intercept pathogen inactivation technology for manufacturing pooled platelets sorolin treated or PPPT at Canadian Blood Services. PPPT was introduced by Canadian Blood Services at select hospitals in January of 2022 and rollout has continued over the past number of months well into 2023. Canadian Blood Services has submitted to Health Canada applications for manufacturing additional platelet products, which would be the apheresis platelet sorolin treated or APPT and untreated apheresis platelet in pass E. Implementation will await Health Canada approval, but we are hopeful as of the time of this recording to have our approvals in soon for um, ongoing implementation. We have been providing customer letters to keep everyone up to date with anticipated rollout dates and um, awareness of Health Canada approvals, and we'll continue to do that. So let's talk about PPPT production specifically. The production of PPPT begins with the collection of whole blood from donors at a CBS center. Whole blood units are centrifuged to separate out the Buffy coat, which contains platelets and leukocytes from the plasma and red blood cells. Seven Buffy coats, one from each donor, is then pooled together and platelet additive solution is added. We're gonna talk about PASS in the next few slides. 
The Buffy coat pool is then centrifuged and the platelet rich supernatant is extracted from the remaining red blood cells retained in the Buffy coat through a platelet sparing leukoreduction filter to produce a double dose pooled platelet. This is now leukoreduced and the double dose pooled platelet is ready to be pathogen inactivated. Pathogen inactivation occurs with the addition of amethysaline, a sorolin, and exposure to UVA illumination to inactivate pathogens and leukocytes. Sorolin is then removed from the compound by a compound adsorption device, and the double dose PPPT unit is split into two single dose PPPT units ready for transfusion. And this is a lovely diagram, and there's also a demonstration of this process available on the ProfEDU website that shows an animated version. The production steps for apheresis PPT are demonstrated here. These are collected from a single donor who can yield two units, and similarly, the units contain pass and undergo additional uh, the addition of sorolin, exposure to UV illumination, with subsequent removal of sorolin prior to issue. These units do not undergo back T testing. And here is some comic relief for you about expanding the platelet pool. Let's move now to a discussion of platelet additive solution. PAS is a crystalloid nutrient media designed to replace a portion of plasma within platelet units. The ratio of PAS E to plasma in PPPT, APPT, and untreated apheresis platelets in PAS E are all approximately 60 to 40. The formulation of PAS used at Canadian Blood Services is called PAS E. And this solution is utilized with the intercept solution, uh, the intercept system, and it's the Maco Pharma SSP Plus. And this contains specifically acetate, citrate, phosphate, potassium, magnesium, and NaCl. PASS is an inert solution compared to suspension with plasma. And because it dilutes plasma proteins, cytokines, isoagglutinins, and other bioactive molecules in the product, past stored platelets have reduced risk of allergic and febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reactions and reduced isoagglutinin teeters in the product. There are no differences reported in hemostasis and transfusion intervals when compared to platelets that are suspended in plasma in clinical studies. We're going to talk now about some indications and contraindications, as well as benefits and drawbacks. Pathogen-reduced platelets have the same indications as untreated platelets with the following addition. Irradiation is not required or indicated, and CMV negative uh, status is considered for all of these products. Pathogen-reduced platelets have the same contraindications as untreated platelets with the following additions. Contraindicated for platelets with a history of hypersensitivity reaction to amethysaline or other sorolins, and they would be contraindicated for neonatal patients treated with phototherapy devices that emit a peak energy wavelength less than 425 nanometers or a lower bound emission a lower bound of the emission bandwidth of less than 375 nanometers due to the potential for erythema resulting from interaction between ultraviolet light and amethysaline. But please note that phototherapy, which for infants with hyperbilirubinemia in Canada, use a blue-green light, which is the standard of care, and blue-green light has a peak wavelength of 450 to 460, which is a safe wavelength range for use of these products. Please note that for any patients who have demonstrated contraindications, 
Canadian Blood Services will continue to offer upon request only non-pathogen reduced platelet products as needed. And there will be untreated products for intrauterine transfusion, but again, on request and with advance notice. Safety endpoints from clinical trials and published hemovigilance data shows favorable adverse reactions and safety profiles. There were fewer allergic and febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reactions, and the signals of safety compared to untreated platelets in a 2017 Cochrane review showed no change in thromboembolism, anaphylaxis, acute transfusion reactions, and no increase in adverse events in clinical trials. With regards to clinical outcomes, there have been no differences reported in mortality, any bleeding event, clinically significant bleeding, or severe bleeding when pathogen-reduced platelets are compared to untreated platelets. Studies have shown that pathogen-reduced platelets lead to lower corrected count increments, increase in the number of platelet transfusions, and a shorter time interval between transfusions compared to those who received untreated platelets. These differences, however, are small as outlined on this slide. Non-immune platelet refractoriness is also more frequently observed. Here's a product comparison with a uh, sorolin treated compared to a current platelet. Both components look a little different. They're in a different bag and typically the sorolin treated component is lighter in color due to the use of pass instead of plasma. With respect to platelet refractoriness, a large randomized control trial compared intercept to untreated platelets, the SPRINT trial, and detected that refractoriness tended to be transient in both arms of the study. The intercept arm did require more platelet transfusions, but there were no significant differences in HLA alloimmunization or platelet-specific antigens between study arms. Alloimmune platelet refractoriness and need for HLA-matched platelets were uncommon and comparable in both groups. In another trial called the IPTAS trial, patients were assessed for the presence of HLA antibodies prior to and following platelet transfusion with either pathogen-reduced or untreated platelets. No statistically significant differences were observed in the rates of HLA alloimmunization, although the study was underpowered. Overall, evidence to date suggests that refractoriness following pathogen-reduced platelet transfusion is most consistent with non-immune causes and can likely be overcome with additional platelet transfusions. Since the approval of intercept treated platelets internationally, several studies have described the safety of these components in pediatric and neonatal patient populations. There is no indication of harm in published studies. The, large of the, the largest of these published was by Delaney et al, who reported on 1,188 patients under four months who received pathogen reduced platelets without issue. Short-term safety data have demonstrated safety, but long-term data are currently limited. There is no published data for the use of intercept platelets in intrauterine platelet transfusions, for which non-pathogen reduced components will remain available upon request. I'd like to move now to pathogen-reduced platelet implementation in Canada. We are taking a multi-pronged approach to this complex implementation that has required significant amounts of work from the hospital front, from the blood center, from uh, our um, blood coordinating network, <laughs> OrbCon, um, and we are so grateful to all of the energy and time and efforts that so many have placed. We have had a lot of communications going out in the form of customer letters, 
and I'll share uh, timelines as they were captured in a recent one on the next slide. The education has been tremendous, uh, both from colleagues within the hospital and from colleagues at Canadian Blood Services who have created tremendous, tremendous resources that I will capture on a subsequent slide for you, but I would encourage you to go out and use the existing resources instead of trying to create your own uh, because why well, duplicate the tremendous amount of efforts that have already um, that have already happened from so many of our colleagues. Um, and we've also been having town halls. So as an implementation date draws closer to a part of the country, we are providing live town halls where there's a short presentation and then uh, individuals from the medical community at Canadian Blood Services, for example, me and Dr. Xu Yan Ning have been available to answer questions as well. This is the customer letter that was posted on the Canadian Blood Services website at the beginning of April. And at the time that I'm giving this talk, there will probably be a newer update. Um, but suffice it to say that PPPT was implemented January 2022 to hospitals served through the Ottawa distribution site. Dartmouth distribution site implemented March 20th. Winnipeg is coming next, May 15th. And then we're planning for Calgary in the summer. The apheresis product, both with pass treated and untreated, are hopefully going to be coming soon, but we await the Health Canada approval. And we have achieved Health Canada approval for a seven day, day shelf life for the PPPT product since the publication of this customer letter. I also want to add a comment that Canadian Blood Services maintains a national inventory. So every site, whether you're expecting your distribution site to be up and running in the next three months versus in six months from now, we all have to gear up with the expectation that a pathogen reduced platelet could end up on your shelf prior to the scheduled time of implementation. If you know, for some unexpected reason from an inventory perspective that needs to happen. In summary, platelets are really important because they mediate primary hemostasis. Platelet transfusions are given to those with qualitative and or quantitative platelet disorders to prevent or treat bleeding. There are different types of platelet components currently available at Canadian Blood Services. Pathogen-reduced platelet components are being implemented across Canada. So get ready. If they haven't come to your hospital yet, they will be there soon. Thank you very much uh, to Dr. Zeller for providing this excellent and very concise presentation. Uh, it's hard to imagine that you haven't had all your questions answered, but if you do have more questions, please put them in the Q&A. If, if you can't do that, put them in the chat as a second option, and the questions will be answered by the panel discussion. Dr. Zeller will be present in person to answer questions there as well. And that uh, final uh, panel discussion is going to prove to be very interesting as well. Um, and I, I really appreciate Dr. Zeller just outlining also um, how much is available in resources for the labs. I know it's been a little overwhelming um, for laboratories to implement for energy and concentrate, and then now going to solvent detergent treated plasma. And some of us have already implemented uh, pathogen reduced platelets. For others, it's coming down the line. So it's there's been a lot of changes, but the resources that have been made available. Uh, by NAC and Canadian Blood Services have just been incredibly uh, well done and very helpful. Um, so our next and, and final speaker today is uh, Dr. Catherine Rebert. 
Um, and she will be talking about solvent detergent plasma. And I actually wanted to mention just briefly, uh, you're probably aware that only a small proportion of the plasma that is used in Canada, either for plasma transfusion or for plasma uh, products, is from Canadian sources. And so Canadian Blood Services has um, is in the process of opening a lot of donation centers for plasma only. So for those of us who have always thought of donating and were worried about ending up anemic, this would be your way to really contribute. Um, you get your red cells back, um, so much less of an effect of a regular blood donation. There are lots of plasma centers opening. Uh, we have them now in Brampton, I think Ottawa and Sudbury. And there are others coming in Vaughan and St. Catharines and in the fall and more opening soon. So if you are not yet a donor, um, that would be definitely a fantastic way to contribute and much needed. So on that note, uh, going to Dr. Catherine Weaver's presentation. Dr. Weaver is a medical director and special advisor with Canadian Blood Services. She's an associate professor with the Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. She's also an investigator with the McMaster Center for Transfusion Research. Dr. Weber's clinical interests include transfusion medicine, benign hematology, and hemostasis and coagulation. Dr. Weber's areas of research interest include the utilization of blood and blood products and bleeding in patients with bone marrow failure. Dr. Weber. Great, thank you very much. I am going to share my presentation. Um, please let me know if um, this doesn't work. We had some issues in the morning and I really want people to be able to see my slides. So um, they should be appearing on your screen. Uh, please let me know if that's not the case. Um, and while I'm waiting for you to all confirm that you see them, I'd just like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to present. Um, I'd like to express my admiration for the other presenters. I've really enjoyed their talks. And then my appreciation to everyone who's attending. I know you have other things you could be doing, so I hope to make this uh, worth your worth your time. Um, can I get a thumbs up or something if people can see my slides? I've got the chat open. Oh, good. Okay, let's not jinx things because it started off good the last time Looks and then, good. and then. <laughs> All right, um, so here are my conflicts of interest. I have no financial conflicts of interest. I'm an employee of Canadian Blood Services, but I do want to um, say that this presentation is coming from me as a transfusion medicine physician, not as a CBS employee. And that allows me to comment on things that perhaps aren't stated claims within the product monograph. So here's what I'd like to cover today. I'd want to give you an overview of the pathogen reduced inventory at CBS. And this piggybacks on what Mickey presented uh, just in the uh, presentation right before mine. I'd like to give you an overview of the Octopharma solvent detergent process. I'd like to go through Octoplasma, go through its characteristics, if there's anything we need to know about its administration, um, cover off the safety um, benefits to this product, the indications and contraindications, and then uh, talk about special populations that you might be thinking about when it comes to transfusing this product. And finally, I'll go over briefly some real world experience with SD plasma. All right, so for the pathogen reduced inventory, why are we putting you through this change? Because we, we do recognize that um, change comes with significant workload. So we, we recognize that. We thank you for that. But we're doing this because we believe we're providing you with better products that are better for the patient. So in general, pathogen inactivation reduces the residual risk of transfusion transmitted infections. It gives an additional layer of safety and complements our current donor selection criteria and donation testing. The real benefit is number two, though, in my opinion, and that comes from reducing the risk of emerging or unknown pathogens um, that can be transfusion um, transmitted. So I, I think we're, we're good at protecting patients against what we know about, but we don't know what we don't know. And I think all of you can reflect and be um, extremely grateful that COVID wasn't something that could be transmitted by blood because our lives would have been very, very different over the, the past two years. So we're putting this in place. So that's one less worry for the future. 
this is our um, journey towards pathogen reduced plasma. So in 2007, uh, CBS hosted a consensus conference on pathogen inactivation. And now here we are 2023, where we've begun the transition to octoplasma. So in March, all hospitals were able to start ordering SD plasma with the goal of working over the next six months to get to at least 80% of the plasma use consisting of octoplasma. Um, we're also, the, the yellow bubble is going to, we're starting to work on the development of plasma that's collected by Canadian Blood Services and pathogen inactivated by the same process that Dr. Zeller spoke about the intercept method with the goal of ultimately by hopefully 2025, the majority of our platelets and plasma for transfusion will be pathogen reduced. Looking specifically at solvent detergent of plasma, solvent detergent treatment reduces the risk of transfusion transmitted infections and gives an additional layer of safety against envelope viruses. So these are the most common ones and it includes hepatitis B, C and HIV, also um, against bacteria, protozoa, prions, and white blood cells. Note that it's only effective for envelope viruses. Um, and so that means that certain viruses like hepatitis A and hepatitis, and sorry, parvovirus B19 um, aren't affected by solvent detergent treatment, but there are additional steps in the product manufacturing that um, target these viruses that I'll speak about later on. So why did we go with octoplasma? Well, octoplasma is a pooled frozen plasma that then undergoes solvent detergent treatment to reduce, as I've said, the risk of transfusion transmitted viral infections. It's been around and available in Canada for a long time, but until March, it was really only available for special patient populations. So um, you had to um, be a patient undergoing plasmapheresis for various conditions and have other criteria like uh, lung disease or a history of allergic reactions. So because this was a product that we had already introduced in Canada, although limited, we thought that the most timely and cost-effective path to a pathogen-reduced plasma supply was to expand the availability of octoplasma while we were developing our own pathogen-reduced plasma. Um, the benefits of octoplasma, as you can imagine, there's an enhanced safety profile, and that comes in the decreased risk of infections. But also, um, it's associated with a decreased incidence of many adverse transfusion reactions that are immune-mediated, so allergic reactions, transfusion-related acute lung injury or trolley, and other immune reactions. And because it's a pooled product, each unit comes with consistent levels of coagulation factors between units. And this is in contrast to our current plasma because we're getting it from donors. So the levels are similar, but not necessarily um, identical between plasma units. And for the blood system, as was mentioned, because we're now purchasing some of our plasma, this allows us to have more Canadian plasma available for fractionation um, into products uh, that can then be used by Canadian patients. So let's look at the solvent detergent process so you have an understanding of what that is. So the first step is collection of the plasma and then pooling. And Octopharma tells me that they pool anywhere from 630 to 1,520 units uh, from multiple donors. And this pooling step is actually important in that it will reduce the concentration of neutralizing antibodies through dilution. So this means that it will um, lower antibody teeters against blood cells and plasma proteins. And that's likely where we're seeing some of the reduction of allergic reactions and trolley reactions from this product. The pooled plasma then undergoes a sterile filtration step. So um, that removes, because of their size, white blood cells and potentially other contaminants. Now comes the solvent detergent treatment. So that's where the pooled plasma is treated with a combination of 1% tri and butyl phosphate, or let's call it TNBT for ease, um, which is the solvent, and 1% octoxanol, which is the detergent. And the solvent works by um, helping the uh, aggregation between the lipid coat and the detergent. So the solvent's not really doing much against the viruses. It allows the detergent to do its work. And what the detergent does is, if, sort of like if you think of dish soap, how it interrupts interactions between grease molecules and that kind of thing. It does the same thing between the lipid coating of the virus. And the viruses need that lipid coating to be able to survive and replicate. So once that lipid coating is disrupted, the virus um, is inactivated. 
once the solvent detergent has done its work, we can then remove the solvent and the detergent, and that's through castor oil extraction, which removes the TNBP, and then solid phase extraction, which removes the octosanol. The product then goes through an affinity ligand resin column, and this is special because it has specificity for prions, including the agent that um, causes variant CJD. So it's thought that this step improves the safety by um, removing that agent, if present at all, um, at least as demonstrated in the lab. Um, finally, there's a sterile filtration step, which further removes uh, leukocytes, parasites, and larger viruses if they are, and then the final product is frozen, and the volume of the final unit is 200 milliliters. All right, I think this is a part where I've gotten a, a lot of questions. So what is octoplasma and what do we have to know about it when we're giving to patients and, and training our physicians about it? So octopharma has um, similar pharmacokinetic properties as frozen plasma. So the coagulation activity values, so all the levels of the factors are close to the values that we see in normal human single donor frozen plasma. And at least a minimum of 0.5 international units per milliliter is obtained for all cloning factors. So uh, the benefit to octoplasma is that we, as I've mentioned, we have more consistent and standardized cloning factor content compared to single donor plasma, where the levels in donors can, can vary fairly widely, actually. So there's a quite a wide reference range, anywhere from 50 to 200%. The solvent detergent process does reduce levels of protein S and alpha-2 antiplasma. So they're, they're reduced in solvent detergent plasma compared to FP. Uh, this chart, I hope, is readable. It's in there for your reference, and I have no problems providing my slides for you after the fact. And it just um, shows you the various ref levels in octoplasma and FFP. And I've taken this directly from the octoplasma product monograph. I've added in this final column because, as you know, we don't give you FFP, we give you FP. So Dr. Bill Sheffield has um, published on the various levels in FP. And your takeaway from this slide is the similarity uh, between octoplasma and FP and FFP with all coagulation factor levels being above uh, 0.5 IU per milliliter or 50%. There's a modest reduction of protein S and a more significant reduction of alpha-2 antiplasm. So when we're dosing um, octoplasma, I'm going to describe what's in the product monograph and then also take you through some recommendations that the National Advisory Committee or the NAC have put out to, um, to help you. So from the octoplasma product monograph, Similar to um, regular plasma from CBS, the dosage depends on the clinical situation and the underlying disorder. In general, for volume-based dosing, the product monograph recommends 12 to 15 mils per kilogram as a generally accepted starting dose because that should increase the patient's plasma coagulation factor levels by about 25%, which is what we generally need to see in order to see a clinical benefit. So the green box has a sample octoplasma dose calculation um, for a 70 kilogram patient. And the most important thing here to understand is because the units are smaller than our current plasma units, they're 200 milliliters compared to about 250 to 300 milliliters for untreated plasma. You're giving the same volume of plasma, but you may need to give more units. So for a 70 kilogram person, it's about four to five units. But here's the most important part, as with all plasma transfusions, you have to monitor the response both clinically and then with measurement of the appropriate coagulation tests. The NAC has put out a document, um, uh, a guidance document with recommendations for solvent detergent plasma. And if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to go to the NAC website and download it. I, I think it's very, very useful. And there they discuss dosing and they indicate that the correct dose of um, SD plasma should be determined either by weight-based dosing in patients who are hemodynamically stable or by ratio-based dosing for massively bleeding patients. So these would be patients who you trigger your massive hemorrhage protocol for. For weight-based dosing, and this is really nice, they recommend that you use the same formula for both SD plasma and frozen plasma, 10 to 15 mils per kilogram. So most adult patients who are in that 60 to 90 kilogram range will require about four to six units of SD plasma or three to four units of frozen plasma to um, see clinical benefit. But again, make sure you're prescribing based on the clinical situation and the lab tests. 
Um, for massive hemorrhage protocols, there's there's no difference in the number of units required, whether you're using SD plasma or FP. So there's no need to update your massive hemorrhage protocols if you're now putting um, your trauma patients on SD plasma. Uh, from the product monograph, um, they talk about administration. Like plasma, you need to use SD plasma that's ABO blood group compatible. The monograph comments that higher doses or infusion rates can induce hypervolemia, pulmonary edema, or TACO. So that is just like plasma. I wanted to call it this one, and I'll talk about it in the next slide too, because I know it's caused some concern. The product monograph discusses um, the risk of citrate toxicity in, with high infusion rates. And because of that, the monograph recommends a certain in, uh, maximum infusion rate of one mil per kilogram per minute. Um, but I, so I wondered, what, well, what is the difference? Why are we seeing this recommendation compared to FP? So um, uh, thank you to Ken McTaggart and uh, Dr. Bill Sheffield. Um, they helped me put together this um, chart that compares the concentration of citrate in CBS frozen plasma FFP, and that's in the literature, and octoplasma. And I will note that the value there for CBSFP is a calculated um, citrate concentration based on the anticoagulant that we put in and that that's remaining in the final bag. We are, we do recognize it's a bit of a gap and we'd like to have measured values for this. So we are uh, working on that. But for now, we have calculations based on uh, reasonable assumptions. So you can see from this chart, the concentration of citrate in our FP is about 24.5. Uh, millimoles per liter. In the literature, it suggests that FFP has about 20 millimoles per liter of citrate, and Octoplasm's product monograph indicates it has 17. So um, they're all quite similar. If anything, Octoplasma has less citrate. So my conclusion from this is that there's no difference that would suggest there are any additional concerns related to citrate toxicity with the use of Octoplasma. Infuse it as you would frozen plasma. But I will note that with any infusion of plasma, and this includes frozen plasma and SD plasma, there's always a concern of citrate toxicity. So you would use your normal procedures for that. Um, I've had questions about the use of rapid infusers. Uh, so, and, I, and I think this is a, a, a really good question. Um, when we look at current frozen plasma, Canadian Blood Services has not performed studies on frozen plasma using a rapid infuser. And um, this isn't really my area of expertise, but that by that I mean pre-programmed for four to one degrees Celsius, level one infusers, or other blood warmers. Um, we don't comment on their use in the circular of information for our products or in the clinical guide. That said, hospitals have been using rapid infusers to transfuse frozen plasma this way in trauma situations for years and have protocols in place. When we look at octoplasma, there's no information about the use of rapid infusers in the octoplasma product monograph, and I suspect the company has not performed studies. Octopharma has provided a statement that's somewhat helpful. Um, if you're using a blood warmer as part of your hospital protocol, ideally blood warmers should not bring any blood component to a temperature above the normal body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, at which all the constituents of blood have their optimal quality and function. So what I wanted to comment on is that um, there's been some misinterpretation of this. When you have a blood warmer set at 41 degrees Celsius, that's the level, that's the temperature of the heating element that your blood product is rapidly transfusing past. In no way do you ever bring your blood product up to that temperature. And we do have um, some papers in the literature that show this. Also, there's nothing to suggest that the use of a rapid infuser would need to be considered differently for octoplasma compared to frozen plasma. And further, there's no theoretical or scientific reason why a temperature excursion, if any, um, would be worse with octoplasma than when FP. So the takeaway from this is, in my opinion, if you're using a rapid infuser to transfuse frozen plasma to your trauma patients now, there is no issue with using it um, to transfuse solvent detergent plasma. Um, next, I'll go through uh, safety and looking at infectious complications. And this is really why um, we're, we're going through this change. Um, Octopharma, when making octoplasma, uses controls applied to the selection and screening of donors for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and human immunodeficiency virus infection. And then there's other tests that they do that are very similar to what's done at 
obtaining blood services for our donors. So hepatitis B surface antigen, anti-HIV antibodies, and then NAT testing for all the standards, HIV, HBV, HCV, but also added in our hepatitis A virus and parvovirus B19. We don't do those tests right now for our plasma, um, but they do do it for solvent detergent plasma. And as you, and as you recall, Solvent detergent treatment is not effective against hepatitis A and parvovirus B19. Because pooling greatly increases donor exposure, um, that's why they do these additional tests. And they, so they've looked at how they can reduce the risk of hepatitis A and parvovirus B19. And so this slide lists some additional interventions. So there's the testing of donors for HIV and parvovirus B19. There's also the dilution of plasma. And by that, I mean, as if you had one infectious donor um, in your pool of, of over a thousand donors, there's likely dilution of the infectious agent, which may contribute to um, some safety. But this is an interesting one that I didn't realize they did. Um, there's a requirement for a certain teeter of neutralizing antibodies against HIV and parvovirus B19 in both the starting plasma and in the final product. I believe it's a release test. And these neutralizing antibodies are thought to result in immune neutralization. So if there's any virus present, the antibodies um, should be able to neutralize it and also provide passive immunization to recipients. So both of these would serve to limit or prevent virus replication in vivo. And then ex vivo, though there's no um, studies, it's thought to be um, appropriate to reduce infection. So if we look at other um, considerations when it comes to allergic reactions, the literature has um, a number of studies that suggest that um, there's decreased allergic reactions with SD plasma. And that's likely because uh, the large plasma pools may reduce the risk caused by a high allergen dose from a single donor. So currently, if you're giving a unit of FP from a donor who has a high allergen dose, there is a risk of a reaction in the recipient. This risk is decreased because we're taking that one donor and we're combining their plasma with plasma from thousands of other donors. We've seen um, this decreased rate of adverse transfusion reactions um, in hemovigilance data from several European countries that have implemented SD plasma. And then I've just quoted one study. Um, this was done specifically in patients with thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura or TTP, um, and which saw the um, acute transfusion reaction rate per procedure to decrease from 35% down to 1.4% when SD plasma was changed um, from untreated plasma. Another um, risk that's decreased with octoplasma is the risk of transfusion-related acute lung injury or trolley. The octoplasma product monograph actually states that trolley has not been, been observed with octopharma, or sorry, octoplasma. Um, there are studies that show that the antibodies implicated in trolley have not been detected in octoplasma. So they've gone looking for anti-HLA antibodies as well as anti-HNA antibodies, and they've not been found. This is likely because the antibodies, again, are diluted. So if you've got one donor or a few donors who have high levels of these antibodies, um, their antibodies are diluted by the plasma from other donors, and they are actually also likely neutralized by the presence of leukocytes and white blood cell fragments um, initially present in the plasma. And other causative factors may be removed by filtration steps. I do want to note, though, if you go looking forward in the literature, there are trolley reactions that have been reported with the use of SD plasma. Um, and this is this this makes sense when you think about the multifactorial um, uh, causes of trolley and also that threshold. So you, you um, in threshold, threshold theory in the pathogenesis of trolley. So while the risk is likely greatly reduced, um, clinicians still do need to remain vigilant. So if a patient is receiving a blood product, including SD plasma, um, if you're not thinking of trolley, you're not going to be able to react to the reaction. So it's um, the risk is greatly reduced, but likely not zero. All right, when looking at the indications and contraindications, um, this is from the product monograph, but really the indications for SD plasma are equivalent to those for uh, frozen plasma. So it's indicated for complex deficiencies of coagulation factors. It can be used for emergency substitution therapy, 
um, if you have a single coagulation factor deficiency, but that's only when you don't have the coagulation factor concentrate. It's always better to go with the concentrate. And then finally, it could be used for the rapid reversal of the effects of oral anticoagulants when vitamin K is insufficient. Now, I do want to note this is an older product monograph. When it says oral anticoagulants, it doesn't mean all oral anticoagulants. It does not include DOAX. This is just for vitamin K antagonists like warfarin. Also, um, prothrombin complex concentrates would be your next step before you are giving plasma. Uh, these are contraindications from the product monograph. IgA deficiency. Um, if you have a patient who requires IgA deficient plasma, I know that's exceedingly rare nowadays, but your go-to would be CBS plasma collected from an IgA deficient donor. Um, as well, if you have a patient with severe deficiency of protein S, it would be better to give FP. This again is an exceedingly rare con congenital condition that presents with clotting, so uh, would not be a, a general concern. And then finally, if you like all products, if you have a hypersensitivity um, to the and to the product or any of its ingredients. So um, I have had questions about selected special populations. This is fairly well discussed in the octoplasma product monograph. So I, I will refer you there if you need more information than what I um, see. And also the National Advisory Committee document that I referenced earlier when I was talking about dosing um, has, has really good recommendations for these groups. So again, I encourage you to download that document. So let's start with um, our um, pregnant patients uh, or who or, um, and also who may be breastfeeding. There are several studies that have looked at the use of SD plasma use in pregnancy, um, but small. The largest study was 35 patients um, and, and some of the data from non-randomized cohorts of patients. But in these patients, there's been no indication of harm. Um, from the product monograph, it suggests that there's no harmful effects in the mother, embryo, fetus, or child that are to be expected, um, but the product should be used during pregnancy and lactation only if the benefits outweigh the potential risk. I, I will point out that is true for all transfusions. They should only be given when the benefits outweigh the potential risk. The next statement is perhaps more useful based on the limited clinical data they suggest that SD plasma and FB can be considered equally effective in pregnant patients and be used interchangeably. In com countries that have um, adopted SD plasma use, there have not been any clinical concerns in this patient group. For pediatrics, there are larger studies in this group. So the largest study included about 443 patients, no indications of harm and no indications of reduced efficacy in this patient group. Um, the NAG statement uh, suggests that SD plasma and FB can be considered equally effective in pediatric patients and can be used interchangeably. And I've included the references there on the side if, you, if you'd like to look at them. For uh, neonatal and intrauterine transfusions, um, there are studies that describe use in these patients. The largest study is 55 patients, no indications of harm, but what we don't have is long-term studies in this patient group. From the NAC, based on these limited data, there's no reason to expect differences in clinical efficacy with SD plasma as compared to FP. And they highlighted that the reduction in adverse transfusion reactions associated with SD plasma may be advantageous. And I, I will comment, sometimes it's tempting when there's no um, there's no data to 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 um, fall back on, well, then I'm not going to use it. But I, I just, there are definite benefits with this product. Um, with emerging infections and also with um, transfusion reactions. For um, intrauterine transfusions, I don't have any data present. And, and again, that's where the benefits and risks should be assessed before using SD plasma. Uh, for liver disease and transplantation, we actually have a number of randomized control studies um, that have evaluated SD plasma in patients who have coagulopathy either associated with liver disease or who are undergoing liver transplant, and there was no differences in clinical efficacy or adverse events. The Netherlands um, implemented uh, SD plasma for all patients, and they performed a retrospective review of all patients who underwent liver transplantation um, looking before and after, and they found no differences and concluded that SD plasma was safe to use in 
safe for use in this patient population. And from the National Advisory Committee, uh, their statement says ST plasma and FP can be considered equally effective in patients undergoing liver transplantation or coagulopathy associated with liver disease and can be used interchangeably. And then finally, um, thrombotic thrombocytopenic penic purpura is another group. These patients are actually the ones who have been using SD plasma for some time now, so their prescribers are, are quite comfortable with it. And clinical studies have shown that SD plasma is effective and safe when used as a part of plasmapheresis treatments in patients with TTP. Um, that said, there have been no clinical studies that have compared the effectiveness of SD plasma to either FP or cryosupernatant. Um, but the reduction in adverse events and the lower risk of transfusion transmitted infections with SD plasma may be considered advantageous in patients, especially these patients because they're receiving such a large volume of plasma transfusions as part of their treatment. Um, so this is just a reminder um, to go to the product monograph if you have more questions about the special populations. All right, so what about the real world experience with SD plasma? So I mentioned the Netherlands, they switched over in uh, 2014 um, from FFP and their unit size at that time is 300 milliliters and they switched to SD plasma um, with a unit size of 200 milliliters. So similar, exactly what we're doing. Their solvent detergent plasma is called Omniplasma. It's the same as what we're using. It's manufactured by Octopharma, um, but it's just they're actually fracturating, fractionating or, or treating their plasma, so Netherlands plasma, and it's called Omniplasma. Um, SADA et al. conducted a before after study looking at the impact of this SD plasma implementation. And the slide lists the various measurements that they looked at. So they looked at the plasma to red cell unit ratio, the number of plasma units transfused, the number of red cell units transfused, and then the transfusion reaction risks in the period before and after. And what they found, it's so interesting, they found that the total plasma units decreased by 13% during the course of this study um, with no impact. Um, so they, they didn't see any um, loss of clinical efficacy when they went on to look at number of red cell units, which is sort of a surrogate marker um, for bleeding. And when I talk to um, some of the physicians that work over there, what they tell me is that in, in the, they they just had physicians just switched one to one. So where they they um, didn't worry about the decreased volume of the FP, they switched one unit of FFP to one unit of SD plasma. Um, the SD plasma units, as I've said, were not associated with a higher plasma to red cell ratio. So no increase in the number of red cell units transfused to those patients receiving plasma. So no suggestion of increased bleeding. But what they did see was decreased uh, transfusion reaction risks and particularly anaphylactic reactions. So in summary, um, why we're doing this is because of um, the enhanced safety profile with pathogen inactivation as well, the decrease in incidence of adverse reactions, including allergic reactions, trolley reactions, and other immunologic reactions, the consistent levels of coagulation factors that we see in each unit and the consistent unit volume, with some added system benefits of increased Canadian plasma available for fractionation. I did want to highlight um, there are many um, resources that we've created. We recognize that this is a big change for hospitals and we want to make sure you're supported. So from the company, Octopharm has made available a number of resources and they're available on their website. As well, their product monograph is always a, a source of information. Um, from the CBS side, on our professional education website, we've created an, a number of, of, of resources that we hope are useful. Um, Dr. Mack, who's, who's uh, going to facilitate the panel discussion, uh, and uh, Rob Romans were one of the key authors um, of a frequently asked question, oh, Irina was as well too, um, a, a frequently asked question document that includes many common questions, and we're updating it all the time as we get questions from you. As well, there are resources including a clinical slide deck um, that's uh, geared towards prescribers. We made a short version, a long version, and then a short version because we know attention spans are short. Um, we've provided speakers notes along with slides, but we've also narrated the videos in French and English. As well, there's a slide deck for laboratory technologists also available as a narrated video. And finally, um, when we were when we were looking at introducing this product, we did have meetings with um, 
many of you, and there was a request that we generate a one-page clinical summary that could go up with the unit when you're sending it to the floor so that you wouldn't get calls or maybe not as many calls from physicians or nurses who are like, why does this plasma unit look different? So um, there's that that you can download if it's a, if it's a useful tool for you. We're also um, sort of standing by. If there are any other resources we can help you with, uh, we'd, be, we'd be pleased to try and create something if there's something that will make your life easier. Um, for If you have questions, Okta Pharma has many representatives and they are always pleased to answer questions. And I've put in the email address if you have questions about their product. Um, as well, your uh, CBS Hospital Liaison Specialist can be contacted with any questions about Canadian Blood Services, and the plasma we provide or implementation of SC plasma. And then the final email address is my email address um, in case I don't get a chance to answer any of your questions or if something occurs to you after this presentation. Um, so that's the end of my talk. Thank you for, for listening and I hope you found this useful. Thank you very much, Dr. Liebert, for an amazing overview. Um, just, I, I'm really glad that the, all three presentations will be posted on the Orbcon website because it's just so dense with, with all useful and practical information for the laboratories and nurses and physicians that uh, I really hope people will go back to them to have some of their questions answered if they come back later. Um, but this has really been a fantastic overview. I, I don't know if you're out of breath, but I feel I am after uh, all these uh, very dense and informative sessions. So uh, I'm handing it over to Dr. Jonathan Mack, who will be uh, facilitating the questions. And if you haven't already done so, please put any questions in the Q&A or in the chat if the Q&A doesn't work for you. But we will not be unmuting anyone's microphone, so you will not be able to speak uh, your own questions. Thanks, Dr. Ruiz, and uh, thanks again to all the speakers uh, for great, uh, great presentations. Um, before we get into the, uh, I think we're going to leave a bit of time uh, before we initiate the Q and A um, to get uh, Dr. Zeller with us. Um, while we're waiting, I think we had some uh, questions for the audience to get some some interaction. Um, I think Tracy was going to help uh, guide us through some of those questions, and so if we could get there. Phones out to get themselves ready for the poll everywhere. Uh, pull the audience and get some questions answered and see what people are, are thinking, what they've learned. All right. So the first question is, how familiar familiar are you with fibrinogen concentrate? You should be able to answer it if you're on your computer or on your phone watching. And then the second question is, what are your thoughts on the cryostat trials? Because we know um, Dr. Petrosoniak wanted to pull the audience at, during his presentation, so we threw it in there. And then the third question is, what are some advantages of the some of the use of fibrinogen concentrate over the use of cryoprecipitate? Can you see the results coming up on your screen? Yeah. I don't see any myself on my screen, but I don't know if that's uh, Teams has not been very cooperative today, so I don't know if that's just on my end or not. I think you might have to um, answer the question. We can see them in the chat portion. There we go. I don't know if on the uh, on the participants end at the the top uh, toolbar, there's a 
might see a poll um, button in the, where you see the raise your hand, react, et cetera. There's a, a poll section where the questions I think should show up. Is that the right guidance, Tracy? I think so. Okay. And I'm going to pull up Dr. Petrosoniak because these were all uh, based on fibrinogen. You want to comment on any of the the polling answers? I, I don't know that I can see them. How do we see them? Okay, so I think if you go to the chat. Okay, hold on. Yeah. And then view poll. I did click that. Okay, let's see. What room? It's just giving me. I think we just see the questions. I don't know if we see the actual results. Yeah. I think you might have oh. to answer oh. them. I did answer. Okay. <laughs> uh. I think you have to submit an answer. <clears throat> okay. Some positive results. Interesting. Looking forward to the results of cryostat. And uh, yeah, all right. Somewhat, fam most people are somewhat familiar with fibrinogen concentrate. Okay. Lots. Some fair amount of uncertainty. No, no heavy predictors of what cryostat's going to be. Nobody wanted to go out on a limb other than to say looks interesting which is a reasonable response. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if we want to go to the question and answer that are, I know Valerie um, tried to group them all together for you, Dr. Mack, based on each of the uh, speakers. So if you want to start with the fibrinogen ones. Sure, yeah, thanks a lot. And apologies in advance to the panel members. It might feel a little bit like Groundhog Day from the morning session, but I think there were a few questions that were asked this morning that uh, probably worth worth repeating, maybe just for the the benefits of the the afternoon session. Um, just we'll kind of do the same uh, format that we did this morning, where we'll kind of stick to each uh, each topic individually and to avoid switching back and forth and too much whiplash for the audience. Um, so we'll start with you again, uh, Dr. Petrosoniak. In terms of the, uh, I guess one of the questions asked this morning was around the cryostat study. Um, one of the ones that was interesting was around the 28-day the mortality outcome, and uh, I guess just your thoughts around the use of that in MHP trials versus other uh, other uh, um, sort of markers for benefit. You commented in your talk about um, difficulties in showing benefits because we're we're doing so much better with trauma care. Yeah, I think I, I like it's hard. Any, I mean, you look at any study anywhere. It doesn't matter if it's in transfusion or uh, you know sepsis or whatever. Like it's hard to get benefit now for anything because we've gotten a lot better than we did 30 years ago or you know 50 years ago so i i think that that you know makes it harder uh to 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 show benefit i think um i i like that the uh trialists here have gone with 28 day mortality i think that that um will capture if there's some downside risk shortly thereafter that maybe is conferred, you know, maybe maybe early on you get better hemostasis, but then maybe that translates to VTE deaths. You know, I think that that 28 days is a good is a good thing. Um, in proper, which is when what was um, the study published in in the, the around two, 2014, they used um, uh, they they include one of their outcomes was um, mortality related to hemostasis. Some EBM people will say the patient doesn't care whether they die of bleeding or they die of another cause. So I think the all cause mortality really shows that the um, authors are dialed into sort of meaningful patient outcomes. Uh, it's super hard to get to find those. And obviously, we, you know, at me as a researcher and as a as a trauma doc, I am interested in, you know, of amount of volume administered and stuff. So I think that those outcomes will be studied, published. But I think the primary outcome is is pretty good. I wouldn't have minded if it was a co-primary outcome or a 
um, an alternative one of 24 hours or seven days, to be honest, but a 28 day gives you a pretty good window of, of, of seeing, um, you know, how, how an upfront intervention might have downstream impact. And sticking on the, the cryo uh, cryostat study, I guess, with the results um, hotly anticipated, um, but that study using cryo precipitate specifically and not fibrinogen concentrate, um, but our our inventory kind of nationally having shifted primarily to fibrinogen concentrate, um, do, you, do you think it would be fair to, to, to extrapolate and use fibrinogen concentrate uh, as a substitute for cryo precipitate or any, any concerns about that shift? I mean, we know from the fiber study or the fiber study suggested that the two are equivalent products. Um, I guess kind of get your thoughts on that in the in the trauma population. I think we might have, did we lose you there? No, I, we, I'm oh, back. Yeah. It, great. Um, I can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know what the net, network's a little dodgy right now. I'm not sure why. Um, so. Uh, I think that we're probably going to extrapolate on the um, fibers trial to say and translate that into into trauma and just say that um, we are uh, whatever whatever's found in um, in the um, in cryostat will will probably say okay any fibrinogen replacement uh, because of the non inferiority found in fibers that if it you know that that crowd precipitate or fibrinogen um, concentrate is is suitable uh, for if 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 crowd stats found to be beneficial that you can use either product and typically we favor fibrinogen concentrate for the, sort of the wealth of reasons that we described. Thanks. And uh, a few questions have come in around the um, for sort of smaller centers, rural settings, uh, or hospitals where they may not have access to rapid lab testing from in time or fibrinogen levels. Um, and specific, I guess, around the use of empiric fibrinogen concentrate. You, you commented, I think, in your in your talk, you had talked about a few a few indicators um, that that you know have been associated with having a low fibrinogen level. Uh, but any any concerns, I guess, about using fibrinogen concentrate empirically in the absence of of lab values and he risks the patients. I know there's some studies that you pointed to that didn't suggest a benefit. It does seem like um, there's not a lot of harm, uh, but it, it but you can't really say that for certain. Um, so I, I guess I would, you know, cautiously, I think it's reasonable to follow what the recommendations are, you know, our guidelines out of Ontario have suggested that you can empirically give it on your third pack uh, the third cooler pack and and also uh if you're a smaller hospital without fibrinogen or without um plasma give it on your second pack because if a patient's dying you know what else do you have you, you're going to do what you can um so i think in those circumstances i think it's justified because we don't know what else to do we don't have any better options i do think yeah there's probably some soft markers of low fibrinogen uh that we can follow and if you have that then you can you, know, you can base some decisions there I think as long as you're coming at it with the best intention, you you know you think that this patient's coagulopathic, giving early fibrinogen is probably a good idea. You'd certainly fall within what the Europeans would recommend, uh, which is early fibrinogen. Uh, it it's we just in in North America tend not to be so fibrinogen heavy. Um, I, I think broadly, so I. I I, I would like to, you know, I think what will be helpful with, is cryostat. I think it will provide us with a lot of information. In the meantime, um, I personally follow a more empiric, uh, sorry, a more um, a lab-based uh, approach, but I could be wrong with that. Like that may not be the right thing to do. Or, you know, you have rapid testing that's, you know, you got to have an eye stat that tells you what the fibrinogen is within a matter of minutes. I think the the Europeans would say you should have Rotem, which would be sort of more real time or tag, and you would get real time lab values, and then you can make informed decisions. I was surprised to see how few uh, postpartum hemorrhage patients are have low fibrinogen, despite a loss of you know one point five liter blood loss. Like that surprised me because we're always taught like they are the ones that have, you know that that fibrinogen is crucial. Mm -hmm. So to me, that was um, 
that that was uh, impressive. Mm -hmm. On the on the uh, the topic of I guess timing to administration, um, the uh, you know the, the the Ontario MHP guidelines have fibrinogen concentrate showing up fairly late, like box three, um, and, and there's been a lot of attention I guess paid to uh, especially in the American literature and trauma on on time to plasma administration. Um, Kind of interesting to see the European approach where they're they're using the fibrinogen concentrate or plasma up front. Um, what are your thoughts, I guess, on on the importance of of time to fibrinogen concentrate administration? I guess given some of these studies that haven't shown a benefit to to empiric use. Um, I would bet that early is better based on everything we've seen in trauma care that that if you can get stuff replaced early, like with if we look at TXA, it seems to be better early than late. Uh, if we can, um, fibrinogen levels, we know drop early on, like immediately after, uh, you know, when they take blood samples of critically injured patients on scene, we see drops in their fibrinogen. So I have to imagine that if there's going to be benefit, it would be early, um, which is counter to what I do. <laughs> so I, I don't know that I, I think it's a practical thing. I think the problem is, is that there's some logistical hurdles, like, I'm not the one physically hanging or reconstituting the fibrinogen. It's my nursing colleagues who, you know, are part of our trauma team that are doing that. And honestly, they have like a hundred other other things that we're trying to accomplish at the same time. So there's some barriers there, but maybe we need to reprioritize. I don't, you know, that that part. I hope we learn a little bit more over the next the coming uh, months and and years because they'll often be hanging blood products like for volume. So instead of maybe I should be giving fibrinogen concentrate and then I wouldn't need as much volume. I don't know. I don't know the answer. Um, but I do think that, you know, the Europeans might be onto something here with early fibrinogen, empiric early, you know, within an hour of, of arrival, which is in contrast to, I think, what most of us are doing in Canada. Um, now, I don't know everywhere. I'd be curious if if some people have some comments, if they're giving early fibrinogen empirically, but a lot of the data doesn't really support straight up empiric. Um, but also, you know, as you guys know, bleeding patients aren't all the same at all. Like the, the, the pathophysiology that exists in a trauma patient and even in the subset of coagulopathic trauma patients compared to non-coagulopathic ones, compared to uh, postpartum hemorrhage, you know, like these are a heterogeneous group of patients. So it's really tough. The future, I think, is customization. How we get there, I don't know. I don't know what that it looks like, but but uh, customize, I think, is is the way to go. Mm. Are you familiar with any of the data that the uh, kind of the basis for the the optional use of uh, or the option of plasma or fibrinogen concentrates uh, that you you touched on for for European guidelines or how they make the decision between one versus the other? They have like a kind of an interesting write up in their guidelines about that. Um, a couple paragraphs on sort of how that came out, but it's not like it's not that strong. I've reread it a few times because I'm like, how did you guys get here? Um, and they basically uh, sort of just extrapolate that if you're giving a bunch of red blood cells, we should be matching the, And presumably there's a loss of blood volume due to hemorrhage that we should match and replace the fibrinogen that's being lost in that blood volume. That's kind of where they come at it from, uh, but it's not strong data um, at all. Um, but, uh, no, you know, the, and then in proper, we didn't replace fibrinogen at all, so or in any meaningful way. So, uh, no, it's not, it's not clear. They then just borrow association or um, correlation kind of level data and say, well, Patients with low fibrinogen do worse, so we should probably replace it, which, mm -hmm. you know, I guess, like, I don't know, we may have learned something from, like, you know, uh, recombinant factor seven, like, uh, th that goes down too, but that didn't pan out, did it? Right, yeah. So, so I don't know the answer. I, I think we should still remain skeptical, but, you know, in the face of uncertainty, we can, you know, make our best decision as long as it's a genuine and, and, and plausible, biologically plausible approach. Mm-hmm. I guess on the topic of reconstitution, uh, you mentioned your your uh, your center is it's being reconstituted at the bedside, right? So I guess some um, I don't know if you can comment. Uh, potentially, some of the other speakers on the panel can comment about the challenges of lab reconstitution versus bedside reconstitution. 
a bit of variability probably across the country of how that's done? It is. Um, we know this from the first two trial, which was a, a trial that just ended a couple, about two months ago. Um, different uh, sites do different things. So the lab in some cases would reconstitute um, the, uh, the the fibriga um, in the lab. And then in some cases it would be reconstituted at the bedside by the nurses. And I, you know, I think it, it's, it comes down to understanding that there's opportunity cost on both sides. Like if the lab is reconstituting and there's only one lab tech to do that, that means that they're not going to be able to get out the rest of the products. And so, and vice versa. Uh, if you have a nurse that's reconstituting it, then maybe they can't hang the products. So uh, I don't know that there's like a, a right answer. I think whatever, you know, it, it probably a balance of the human resources. Uh, where is there the greater upside and the greater downside and, and weighing that we ultimately continue to have the nurses do it at the bedside. I think as the products become more familiar to people, like most places do PCC at the bedside, I think we'll see more Fibriga done at the bedside or, you know, fibrinogen concentrate done at the bedside. Um, and that will be where it lands. But I can tell you, I was in many meetings with our nurses who were not happy to have an extra um, workflow that they had to learn and, and work through. Um, but it was a, it was a contentious, contentious issue at our site. Mm. So it's such a, such a, I guess, resource intensive situations. Everyone's going to be happy if someone else can take a, take a task off their hands. Um, we, we touched, uh, this, this morning, Adam, I think probably worthwhile coming back to the, the topic about F, FC use in neonates. I know, uh, I know you're not a neonatologist, but I don't know if you could comment a bit on, perspectives on neonatal use or even open that up to to Dr. Weber or Dr. Zeller. I mean, I think we heard from from Catherine and Michelle um, on this, so I might defer to them. It was it did. I think part of it you alluded to, Jonathan, the dosing piece, which I hadn't really thought about. But yeah, the the the, the vials come in one gram vials, which are you, you give sort of you, you administer about it's about 50 cc's that gets mixed in and then you have to sort of come up with I guess you'd have to then remeasure how much comes out, which is not what we do in adults. You would then do that th three more times and just give the whole thing. Uh, so I would maybe defer to um, some others here who know more about this stuff than I do. Yeah, it's exactly that. I think so. There's nothing about fibrinogen concentrate that would make it any less efficacious or safe in neonates compared to adults, but. Um, I, I know that there are some um, uh, pediatric hospitals that have not switched over for their uh, smaller patients because of concern about wastage uh, in in the vial. And, and also, um, I guess, Johnny, I hadn't really thought of, but the, the concern about overdosage if they send the vial up to, depending how it's sent to the patient, if too, too much could be given. So, so it's more practical considerations when it comes to neonates than any thought that the product wouldn't work the same way. Mm -hmm. It's also, are, is, am I working? Like, can you guys hear me okay? We can, yeah. yeah okay. Um, the, the other pieces that uh, are very, very tiny as patients, um, they don't need a lot of fibrinogen, which is good, right? Like it's, it's not the most frequent patient population that we are giving product to, which is good. Um, but I think sometimes that uh, contributes to less knowledge about something. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's, it's a safe product, right? This is a safer, um, a safer product that's gone through additional safeties. Um, it's standardized. So yeah, like, you know what you're giving. And I, I know that we, we won't amass the same body of evidence in, in a neonatal patient, patient population, but I don't think that that should stop us from using something that's technically safer. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I'm not a neonatologist, but um, but that is my <laughs> my two cents. Now, I mentioned this morning there is data, and you know at least in, in up to or as low as 2.5 kilogram for, for cardiac surgeries for pediatric patients or infants that that it's uh, used and and no safety concerns in that group. So sort of some some reassurance on that front. Um, we, we talked this morning already about the tranexamic acid use. I think there were some questions that came in about that. I, I think there's no doubts that I think most transfusion physicians and, and people who treat bleeding patients love tranexamic acid. Um, I think specifically the question was about the use in, in the MHPs in Ontario, if you could comment on whether or not it is, uh, it's endorsed or not. 
and how that might affect factor replacement and blood loss and kind of what the role is for MHPs. Right. Um, yeah, I made the comment that it should be in the water. And so I stand by that comment. Um, I, I do like uh, TXA. We fully endorse it uh, through um, the MHP recommendations that have come out in Ontario. We have tried to shift to a more clinician centric approach of, of giving it, recognizing that the crash two trial said to do one gram followed by one gram over eight hours, which is a real pain for uh, clinicians at the bedside who are trying to, you know, now you have tied up a, um, a line for infusion. So we do a two gram bolus over 10 minutes or whatever your hospital will allow 20 minutes, something like that early and earlier is better. Every, every study now keeps telling us that even if you can get it in under an hour from injury, that's even better. And the work from uh, that Jeannie Callum has done in Ontario of now getting pre-hospital uh, administration uh, is, you know, hopefully going to uh, show some benefit at a at a clinical level, um, and we'll be capturing that over the next few um, few years, and we're now tracking that type of stuff. So, I think TXA is a complement. It's a suite of things that we do to help bleeding patients. You know, we try and keep them warm. We uh, try and maintain a pressure that's suitable, depending on if their brain or their 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 torso is injured. We we try and replace some product, uh, sort of replace some factors. And so this is, and not a single, you know, I don't think there's one linchpin in this that that will just, you know, either you live or die based on what you get. But there are multiple things that will make you have a better chance of surviving massive hemorrhage. Uh, and so in in conjunction with TXA, you know, fibrinogen would be one of those things. There is some controversy around TXA, like particularly the, for some reason, Americans don't really like it. They they think that everybody has fibrin, um, you know, um, uh, fibrinolytic shutdown. So that this sort of phenotype, I guess, that it can exist where you actually don't have fibrinolysis the way that we see it in in trauma patients. So they are so worried that that's the case, but it seems to be a minority of patients. And by by and large, most patients seem to benefit from TXA as if, if they're bleeding. Um, and we have pretty wide parameters uh, to give it with, CRASH-2 says there's really not a lot of um, harm. Um, you know, as the doses go up, probably there's some VTE complications that can that can manifest but we have pretty good experience i think in the cardiac surgery literature at higher doses uh and and seems to be okay so i i like it i think it's a great compliment particularly if i'm a, in a small hospital when i'm doing locums like that's where i'm focused at giving the stuff that i can do it's it's easy it's quick it saves lives it has an absolute mortality benefit so so that's that definitely should be something that we should focus on and it is a metric that we're following in ontario mm -hmm. And in the, in the GI bleeding population, that's, that one was kind of a population that uh, was highlighted by the HALTED trial recently to have shown maybe not as much benefit, uh, potential harm in there. Do, you, does that, do those results kind of modify your approach to that group specifically? Yeah, prior to 2018, I would give it, I would give TXA and then HALTED came out and now I don't. Um, and I think it probably speaks to the fact that they must not be experiencing hypofibrinolysis like the way that a trauma patient does. Like that's a, it's a like I mentioned, the you know all bleeding patients are not the same. I mean there is blood leaving them, so that you know puts them all in the same category. But they're not quite the same at a at a molecular level or a cellular level. Uh, um, and so when you get more granular, it it they are different. And um, halt it didn't show benefit, and there was a sort of an indication maybe there's some harm uh and and so i i don't give it routinely now i guess if a patient's gonna die maybe i would give it they, those kind of patients were excluded from halt it where like the the clinician was allowed a little bit of latitude to say if you just think they need it then just go give it and, and we'll exclude them from the trial but they had a pretty sick group like they were representative of what we would see in our emergency departments so you know i think they did a great job with the trial um, and, and so I've, I, I have changed my practice. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Tracy, I don't know if there, are there any other comments or questions that uh, came up in the chat that I haven't touched on yet? Uh, no, I think all the rest of them are for platelets and for SDP. 
Perfect. Well, maybe move on to uh, to platelets just to provide a little little difference from the morning. Um, so thanks, thanks, Dr. Zeller, for for joining us and for the talk this uh, that that you provided. Um, I, a few questions came up in the in, in the Q and A, uh, I guess, around uh, the difference in increments that that are observed in the different trials with pathogen reduced platelets compared with uh, untreated platelets. Um, can you speak a little bit a little bit further on that point and and kind of what what people might be expecting when they're when they're transfusing them and how clinically significant that is? Sure. Um... So my recollection is that the increment wasn't tremendously different. So I think it was something like four, like 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 um, maybe your increment was supposed to be, uh, let's say it was 27 and now it's 23 on average. But um, it's a really important point to remember that all of the products that we're currently giving are highly variable. Um, an apheresis product could come from someone with a platelet count of 187 or 392. And there is significant variability, again, across all of the different products that we give. So the most important thing, um, and to recall that each of the recipients are a variable, unique context. So every time you give a platelet, um, you know, you might think, oh, this platelet's going to make my person, my patient go up by 30, and it goes up by 20. Is that the product? Is that because there's consumption in the patient? Is that because the patient has a very large body uh, volume of blood? Um, it, because it's a you know six foot four person who's who's um, 150 kilograms versus someone who's not bleeding and not consuming but just isn't producing, who's a 60 year old uh, sorry a 60 kilogram person. Um, who's five foot two, like it's it's highly variable when you take a product and you put it in a person. So I would say the most important thing for you to do is reassess after you give a dose. Um, you, we talked about this morning, um, Johnny, you had mentioned that um, maybe there's like a weeny, eeny, weeny bit more um, from an inventory perspective that you're seeing go out. But what my understanding is that, you know, if you were going to give a patient um, 10 units of platelets over their 30-day admission in an induction, maybe you're looking at 12 units this time. So not like a vast difference, but you may in the long term see a little spike. Um, but, uh, but again, I think the most important thing is that every time we give a product, we reassess and see how the patient did um, because there's so many factors that go into that increment. Mm -hmm. And on, on that kind of on the same uh, sort of Category, I guess, on the on the the increment. Um, one of the interesting questions from this morning uh, came up was around the when should you be worried about HLE refractoriness if if we know that there might be a uh, or we, we expect a bit of a lower increment or that patients might not increment due to the pathogen reduced product, not because of HLA. Um, you know, should we be changing how we approach testing and and waiting waiting a bit longer to do HLA testing or not with uh, when, when we start using pathogen reduced platelets more often? Um, yeah, so I, I'm i not sure that um, I would change an algorithm because I think for me, each patient, again, is a unique entity. And I'm always thinking to myself, what are the non-immune contributing factors that are leading to this um, lack of increment? So as opposed to just, oh, my patient didn't increment well two times or three times, um, maybe it's because they're septic and they are in, you know, rip-roaring DIC or they just came out of a, you know, a big surgery and their platelets are all getting occupied doing lots of things. Um, so, uh, and we know from the literature that it's more non-immune contributing causes. There doesn't seem to be an increase in um, immune causes of refractoriness. So I think it's important to keep in our minds um, I think that it would be very interesting from a CBS perspective to um, monitor how many um, test requests we're getting for HLA testing for platelet refractoriness and see if we get an increase. Um, and then, of course, we're doing all kinds of post-implementation monitoring of inventory, and, um, and we'll see. We'll see what having a slightly smaller um, concentration and a slightly smaller increment will translate to in terms of um, imp um, the inventory. Perfect. And uh, you described really nicely the, uh, I guess, the, the production steps and, and the uh, the use of PAS for uh, for the pathogen reduced platelets. Um, that might have an impact, I guess, on ABO 
on ABO titers and, and some questions, a couple of questions touched on ABO incompatibilities for platelet transfusions and if, if PAS, uh, the use of PAS and pathogen reduced platelets makes that any, any less of a concern, no difference, uh, would the use of ABO incompatibility change what the increments are because of the ABO incompatibility? I guess I don't know if you could comment a bit on your thoughts. <laughs> these are hard questions. They I kind of wish Catherine, <laughs> Catherine was answering the questions because she does a really good job with the hard ones. Um, but what I would say is, you know, in theory, you are giving less plasma and therefore there are less isohemagglutinins in the plasma, right? So um, there's... Uh, 75 ml of, of plasma now, and there used to be like 200 ml of plasma. So you would think if, that there would be less antibodies floating around. Now at my center, we cross the ABO barrier with, uh, with platelets and yes, hemolysis can happen, but it's rare. And so, you know, we monitor for it, but we do it. Um, a lot of centers do it. And the, we just raised on I think it was our last MD call about some very cool stuff that we could do to look at teeters, where you look at the teeters of the different donors who are contributing to the pool, so all the seven donors, then you look at what happens when you are adding pass, and each person is only contributing like 15 ml of plasma. So what does that mean from a um, if everyone is low teeter and everyone in another one is high teeter, when you look at the teeter of the total product, are they all low teeter equivalent? Um, I don't have the answers to that, but I think some, it's some very cool opportunities for some really interesting and exciting research. Um, and we probably won't see anything labeled as low teeter until we move towards apheresis because you require low teeter on seven donors to call it low teeter as per the current definitions that we have. Um, but once apheresis is unveiled, hopefully around June, middle of June in Ottawa, that's the plan, pending Health Canada approvals, um, then you might actually start seeing um, some low teeter labeled products um, on the platelet front. So yeah, Johnny, you'll be the first to see those come out and you'll let us know. Great. I know locally we don't we haven't actually been making much use of it. We we cross the ABO barrier for our platelet transfusions if if needed and and haven't been um, overly concerned about the teeters uh, to date, yeah. uh, which is I think mostly based on some of the the data from Nancy Dunbar's group in Vermont and, and some of the best best studies on that. I remember getting a call when I was covering like medical office for Canadian blood services from a smaller hospital. And they were like, we need to give this platelet right now, but it's the wrong, it's like, it's not the right blood group. And I was like, yeah. And, and it was, and it dawned on me. I'm like, Oh, not everyone does what, what, what we do. Like we don't think twice. It's like, Oh, we got this on the shelf. Okay. Let's give it. Um, so, um, uh, so it, it is quite a variable practice around the country mm -hmm. and people's comfort level um, and practice patterns is just very, very different. So I think it's, um, it's always neat when we can get together and talk about how uh, some things are the same and some things are different and there's merit to all the things that we do um, and we can share and we can learn. Absolutely. On the, on the teeter front, I, think, I guess that introduces an, an additional variable where there's a lot, a lot of uncertainty even around what teeters, what teeter threshold is important, and that's that's also fairly un, not well defined. So a lot of a lot of things to to learn. Yes, um, I agree. I don't know if you if you know. I, it's an interesting question, just around the the difference in cost uh, between an untreated versus a pathogen reduced platelet product. Yeah. So I asked that at, I, I'm very privileged and I get to go to all these meetings with all these incredible people at Canadian blood services from the different divisions and they're all spectacular. And I, I remember at the start, I was like, so are we saving money doing this? Cause we don't have to do the back T testing, you know, and everyone on the call kind of laughed and they were like, no, Mickey, this is not saving money. Um, so I think this is an expensive endeavor, but I, I do not know the cost per 